APGO Basic Science Video Topic Ectopic Pregnancy Ectopic pregnancies are pregnancies abnormally implanted outside the endometrial lining of the uterine cavity. The reported incidence of ectopic pregnancy is between 1 to 2 percent and remains one of the leading causes of early pregnancy-related death. The objectives of this video are to describe the normal histology of the fallopian tube, to understand the pathophysiology of ectopic pregnancy, and to understand the pharmacology of methotrexate. To review the clinical management of ectopic pregnancy, please review the AFCO educational topic number 15. Let's meet our patient. She is a 26-year-old Gravida 1 at 6 weeks estimated gestational age who presents to the emergency department for spotting and left lower quadrant pain. Labs are drawn which demonstrate a beta HCG of 2500. You decide to order a pelvic ultrasonography. It demonstrates no evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy and is concerning for a mass in the left adnexa. Shown here is the left ovary with an adjacent mass. You are worried about an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancies can implant in several locations, but 95% of ectopic pregnancies occur in the fallopian tube. The remaining 5% of ectopic pregnancies occur in the ovaries, abdominal cavity, cervix, and cesarean section scars. Before we review the pathophysiology of ectopic pregnancies, let's review the function, histology, and anatomy of the fallopian tubes. The role of the fallopian tube is to capture the ovulated egg, provide an environment for fertilization with sperm, and to transport the zygote to the uterus, typically within three days. The histology of the fallopian tube is unique to accomplish this task. There are three layers to the wall of the fallopian tube, the mucosa, muscularis, and serosa. The mucosa layer is composed of simple columnar epithelium and the lamina propria, which is directly below the mucosa is made up of connective tissue and a large number of blood vessels. This epithelium has two types of cells. The first type are ciliated, columnar cells, to aid in egg transport. The second are PEG cells. PEG cells are non-ciliated secretory cells which produce substances that provide protection and nutrition for the egg and sperm. Zooming out, you can see the presence of mucosal folds. Deep to the mucosa is the muscularis layer. The muscularis layer is composed of two layers, the inner layer is circumferential, while the outer layer is composed of longitudinal smooth muscle, which produces wave-like contractions assisting in transport. The serosa is highly vascular and is continuous with the visceral peritoneum. There are several segments to the tube which help with its overall function. The most distal segment is the infundibulum. It contains the fimbriae, which are finger-like extensions of mucosal folds that project toward the ovary. As noted previously, they help trap the ovum after ovulation. Next is the ampulla, a widened segment near the distal end. It is the most common site of fertilization. It is also the most likely location for ectopic pregnancy, accounting for 70% of ectopic pregnancies. The isthmus is the narrow segment adjacent to the uterine wall. The interstitium penetrates the uterine wall. The myometrium of the uterus contributes to its muscularis layer. In general, as we move towards the uterus, the amount of mucosal folds and ciliated cells decrease, and there is an increased proportion of smooth muscle in the muscularis layer. As previously noted, fertilization typically occurs in the ampulla, creating a zygote. The zygote is surrounded by a glycoprotein layer called the zona pellucidum. From days 0 to 3, division occurs to form the 16-cell morula, which nears the uterus. On day 4 to 5, differentiation begins and the blastocyst forms. The blastocyst consists of an inner cell mass, as well as outer cells called trophoblasts, and a fluid-filled cavity called a blastocele. In the uterus, the blastocyst is hatched from the surrounding zona pellucidum in response to proteases secreted by the endometrium. The hatched blastocyst then implants into the endometrium at day 6 to 7. At time of implantation, there are three processes that occur. The first is apposition, in which there is a loose connection between the trophoblast cells of the blastocyst to the endometrium. Second is adhesion, in which the blastocyst is anchored to the endometrium. Third is invasion, in which the trophoblasts invade maternal capillaries and vessels in the endometrium, providing nutrients essential for continued growth. Let's pause, read, and apply. Trophoblasts differentiate into which two cell types? The two cell types are cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts. Cytotrophoblasts are undifferentiated stem cells of the placenta, and syncytiotrophoblasts are multinucleated cells formed by fusion of proliferating cytotrophoblasts. 
The syncytial layer is responsible for the invasion of maternal vessels and secrete HCG, which is critical in maintaining the corpus luteum in early pregnancy. Now that we have reviewed normal function of the fallopian tube and normal implantation in the endometrium, what causes an ectopic pregnancy? Remember that most ectopic pregnancies occur in the fallopian tube. Ectopic pregnancies occur if there is a delay or prevention of the passage of the fertilized oocyte to the uterine cavity secondary to abnormal fallopian tube anatomy. Abnormal anatomy can occur with prior ectopic pregnancy, inflammation and scarring from chlamydia, gonorrhea, or pelvic inflammatory disease, peritubal adhesions from surgery or endometriosis, or salpingitis isthmica nodosa, which results in nodular thickening of the proximal tube. The etiology is unknown, but occurs when the tubal mucosa penetrates into the muscularis layer, leading to hypertrophy of the surrounding muscle. In addition, there may be factors inherent in the embryo which result in premature implantation. This has been proposed as a potential factor for increased incidence of ectopic pregnancy following in vitro fertilization. Other risk factors such as cigarette smoking may affect cilia and smooth muscle function within the tube. Let's go back to our patient. In this case, an ectopic pregnancy is suspected on ultrasonography. Ectopic pregnancy is suspected when there is no evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy with the presence of an anexal mass. In the anexa, there is a mass adjacent to the left ovary. Ultrasonography is also useful in detecting hemoperitoneum, appearing as echogenic or complex fluid in the pelvis. What if the ultrasonography was non-diagnostic? If a patient is hemodynamically stable, it may be reasonable to repeat the beta HCG level in 48 hours. In normal pregnancies, the rise is typically at least 50% every 48 hours. There have also been studies that demonstrate that even a 35% rise in 48 hours can be normal. In ectopic pregnancies, there can be lower than expected rises in beta HCG, secondary to failure of appropriate blastocyst implantation. However, it is important to note that ectopic pregnancies may have a normal rise in beta HCG and the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy should be considered even with no masses on ultrasonography until an intrauterine pregnancy is diagnosed. Because of our patient's ultrasonography findings, you discuss with her your concerns that she has an ectopic pregnancy. You discuss the importance of treatment. She asks you, why is it so important to have treatment? Can I just see what happens? You review with her that unfortunately, ectopic pregnancy can be an emergency if it ruptures. Ruptured ectopics can occur because the rapidly proliferating trophoblasts invade quickly through the epithelium of the fallopian tube. The blastocyst implants near or within the muscularis. The expanding products of conception invade maternal vessels, causing hemorrhage and potentially rupture of the tube. You review with the patient that treatment of ectopic pregnancy can be medical or surgical. Candidates for medical treatment include women that are asymptomatic, hemodynamically stable, and compliant with care, as follow-up with beta-HCG levels is necessary. Methotrexate has been traditionally used for medical treatment. Let's review its mechanism of action. Methotrexate is a folic acid antagonist. Typically, the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase converts dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate, the active form of folic acid. Folic acid is critical to the synthesis of purine and pyrimidines in dividing cells, allowing for DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. Methotrexate competitively binds to the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. This blocks the conversion of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate and inhibits the synthesis of purine and pyrimidines, leading to arrest of DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. It is very effective against rapidly proliferating tissue such as trophoblasts and results in ectopic pregnancy resolution. However, because of its action on rapidly proliferating tissue, it can also affect normal tissue with rapidly dividing cells, such as bone marrow, GI epithelium, and respiratory epithelium. Beta-HCG levels must be followed after methotrexate administration, with an expected 15% drop in levels between days 4 and 7, and continued monitoring needed to confirm resolution of the pregnancy. Alternatively, if women are not candidates for medical management, such as with suspicion for ruptured ectopic, Surgical options include salpingectomy, which is removal of the entire tube, versus salpingostomy, which is making a small hole in the fallopian tube and removing the pregnancy itself. Similar to methotrexate administration, beta-HCG levels must be trended to ensure that the entire ectopic pregnancy has been removed. This concludes the APCO Basic Science video on ectopic pregnancy. We have covered the normal function and anatomy of the fallopian tubes, the physiology of implantation, 
pathophysiology of ectopic pregnancy, and the treatment for ectopic pregnancy, including mechanism of action for methotrexate. Thank you.